Well, thanks everyone for being here today. Um, this is a four week study uh, called The Light of the World by Amy Jill Levine. And I don't know how many of you have heard Amy Jill Levine speak, but she has done several TED Talks. Looks like you, Terry, and Welfa, I know who already has. Uh, she's delightful. Um, she is a professor of Jewish studies and New Testament at Vanderbilt University. And I'm not sure how long ago this study was written, but I found it already to be very insightful because she brings the very Jewishness of Jesus uh, to the study. So glad you're here. If you haven't gotten a book, um, uh, you feel free. I mean, today, of course, we're going to be listening to a video um, of hers. And every week, each video is only about 10 minutes. And then we're going to be discussing. So. Uh, let's open with a prayer. God, for this blessed season of Advent, we give you thanks for permission to speak the truth to you. How long, O oh Lord? And also for the opportunity to worship you and celebrate the love and light you do bring. As we wait during the season of Advent for things that are not yet, but are yet to come, may we wait well, trusting that good things do happen in the dark, even if we don't know about them. May this study be a blessing, an encouragement, and an inspiration to see you in new ways in our lives. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the first question for everybody is, what do you remember about the Christmas story? Um, tell us, you know, a kind of ad lib, what is our Christmas story, the story of the birth of Christ? I think the thing that struck me is the having to travel when you really shouldn't have to go travel. Um, so, you know, embarking on an arduous journey um, when you're pregnant, uh, you don't know what's going to happen, and all these different people traveling. The Magi traveling because of the star. Um, and I, I think about in my life, travels that I've taken um, and stories about the traveling. So I know that there's, I mean, it's the nativity story is this story of the birth of Jesus. But I always come back to all the people traveling, the shepherds leaving their flocks and traveling. Everybody's going someplace. And for us, we don't think a whole lot about travel because travel's relatively easy for us. But, you know, traveling. Fly, say flying from here to Australia <clears throat> is kind of the equivalent maybe for what some of these people were doing with their travel. Even though we look at it on the map and say, well, that wasn't very far that they had to go. Yeah, going by donkey and foot it makes it a whole different thing. Yeah. What else? What else do you remember strikes you? About the Christmas story. But oh, the Christmas. I thought there would be a statistic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no statistics. Well, statistics in the census, I think they're that's collecting. A, yeah, that's you true. know, they're collecting statistics, that, which is interesting. It's always been interesting to me, you know, that realm of 
of the world where people had to go, actually literally, literally go somewhere in order to uh, be, be uh, counted. Thank you. You know, what strikes me is how much Palestine is like that now. Pregnant women cannot get to the doctor. <laughs> It's really, really hard. You can't, they have so many stop checks, gates closed. You can't, can't take that road. You have to take another road. It's almost, uh, almost worse than what Mary went through <laughs> if you're pregnant and having a baby. One Carol that um, is not well known that just struck me always is who would send the baby? Who what? Who would send the baby? No, to God the baby. Say, yeah, who would send the baby to be our savior, to be our our warrior, our Messiah? Who would send the baby? It's just well, you that brings up the whole question of the Trinity. You believe in the Trinity. That's a part of that baby. The baby is part of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of your story this morning, Felicia, where you were talking about the little kid unaccompanied by any kind of family. And I think about how precarious uh, that journey for Jesus was. You know that, um, yeah, he had his parents, but his parents were like nobodies, you know? And so that same kind of uh, real, oh my God, Goodness, is this going to work or not? You know, are we going to make it here or not? And uh, total powerlessness. And then I gave it for a good presentation. And Mary goes to see Elizabeth and give these talks. I just, I know. You know that namaste, you know, people say that mm -hmm. in yoga, the light of Jesus' light, you know, I always think of that. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. How neat, yeah. I know, I love that too. All righty. Well, yeah, and the fact that she just said right away when she found out what it was. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. It was scary after that, I'm sure. I'd be like, uh, no, I think you need a lady across the street. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Uh, yeah, I'm going to put on the video. I guess that's next. I love Christmas. I like the candles. I like the trees. I even like the shopping. When I was a child, I used to go to my friend's house to help trim the tree. I had the best of both worlds. I got to trim the tree. I never had to put it away after the season. But I particularly love Christmas because I love the stories, the accounts, the different accounts we get in the Gospel of Matthew and we get in the Gospel of Luke and we get also from post-biblical church legends. I will sometimes come into church and people get very somber and serious because it's Advent. But if we do, we're missing something. Matthew and Luke are stories of joy and they're also stories of humor about an infertile couple who has a child and that's the birth of John the Baptist about the annunciation of the angel Gabriel to Mary, who says, Mary, you're going to have a child, and Mary asks quite logically, how exactly is that going to happen? 
about Joseph who discovers that his fiance is pregnant and has a dream with an angelic prophecy from the prophet Isaiah telling him what to do. And those fabulous magi who aren't kings, and they're not necessarily three of them, uh, they're Persian astrologers. They are figures of fun. They are fools for Christ. We need to see the profundity in the story, but we also need to see the joy, the challenge, the exuberation to appreciate the story as story, a story that will give rise to multiple interpretations and a story that continues to inspire. The Christmas story in the Gospel of Luke begins not with Jesus, but with Zechariah and Elizabeth. And we first meet Zechariah, who is a priest in the temple. Actually, there were too many priests at the time to serve on a daily basis in the temple. So this might have been Zechariah's one shot at the big time. He's doing the afternoon incense offering, and suddenly an angel appears to him. He's stunned, but, you know, this is the Bible and it can happen. And the angel says to him that, Zechariah, you're a righteous guy and your wife is righteous, and your wife, Elizabeth, she will become pregnant. Zachariah somewhat discreetly says, um, well, yes, except I'm old and, you know, my wife is getting on in years. And the angel, the angel gets a little bit huffy. Look, he says, I'm the angel. I'm reading here from the CEB translation. Zachariah said to the angel, how can I be sure of this? My wife and I are very old. And the angel replied, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the Lord's presence, and I can just picture the angel with this look on his face saying, What? You doubt? Gabriel continues, I was sent to speak to you and to bring this good news, this gospel, this oi angelion, this good news to you. Know this, what I have spoken will come true at the proper time, but because you didn't believe, you will remain silent, unable to speak until the day when these things happen. Poor Zachariah, he's just received good news, he's just received the gospel, and now he can't talk. But we have to worry about the professional situation as well, because following the offering, he is supposed to go out and bless the crowd. Here's how the CEB describes it. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zachariah, and they wondered why he was in the sanctuary for such a long time. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. Then they realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he gestured to them and couldn't speak. When the Gospels were first produced, they were read out loud, indeed performed to congregations. And the fact is a lot of people back in the first century were illiterate, they could not read. So I can picture so easily the storyteller explaining not only that Zachariah had been struck mute and through his gestures, he explained to the crowd what happened. But how do you do that? How do you do in body language the idea that an angel appeared to me? Do you, do you have wings? Do you have a halo? Do you have a look in your face? And the angel said, I'm going to have a baby. What was the crowd thinking? when they listened to Zachariah and more fun. What was the crowd thinking, the, those first audiences, those first churches, when they watched the Gospel of Luke being performed? How do you proclaim the good news in sign language? The angel Gabriel had told Mary not only that she would conceive a child, but that her elderly cousin Elizabeth, who had been suffering with fertility issues, has conceived herself. So Mary goes to visit Elizabeth. The scene is typically called the visitation, and it's in the Gospel of Luke. Here's how the CEB puts it. Mary got up and hurried to a city in the Judean highlands. She entered Zachariah's home and she greeted Elizabeth. I do wonder if Zachariah is there saying, but she greets Elizabeth, and when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So we have this sense of quickening. Elizabeth feels life in her own body. So Elizabeth then, filled with the Holy Spirit, proclaims Mary's own pregnancy. With a loud voice, she blurted out, this is the translation here, but proclaimed is probably better, God has blessed you above all women, 
and he has blessed the child that you carry. Why do I have this honor that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Fabulous. Elizabeth here, although she's not called a prophet, is one. She recognizes from her pregnant cousin something more than just the good news of a pregnancy. She recognizes the mother of her Lord. She recognizes Jesus' role even before he is born. Zechariah, her husband, doubted the angel. Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, makes the correct proclamation, and Mary then responds. The Luke and Christmas story is filled with remarkable news, unexpected but urgently wanted, hoped for news. Zachariah is told that his elderly infertile wife will bear a child. Mary is told that she will have a child even though she has not yet had sexual relations. We are told that this newborn baby will be a Lord. Mary's Magnificat, her hymn, sings about status reversal, past, present, and future. Magi see a star, the good news of the birth of a new king. Herod himself receives some news, not good, that his rule is illegitimate because the true king of Israel has just been born in Bethlehem. We have to be open to staggering news. And rather than just say, oh, that can't possibly happen, rather than have doubt, one of the beauties of the gospel is it helps us envision the world otherwise, see the world differently. Following the Gospel of Luke's four-verse, very fancy introduction, Luke tells us, During the rule of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to a priestly division, and so we launch into the story of the birth of John the Baptist. Following Mary's visit with Elizabeth, Elizabeth gives birth. John the Baptist is named, and there's some fuss about this because they wanted to name him after a family member, but Elizabeth the prophet insists, no, his name will be John. And then the story of John the Baptist leads into the story of Jesus. But the setting is important here. For Luke, John the Baptist is set during the reign of Herod of Judea, locally, internally to the land of Israel. But the birth of Jesus has a slightly different setting. Chapter 2 in the Gospel of Luke begins, In those days Caesar Augustus declared that everyone throughout the empire should be enrolled in the tax list. For Luke, Jesus is not limited to the people of Israel. To the contrary, his birth is set during the reign of a Roman emperor. And so we launch into the story of how Jesus was born not in Nazareth, which is where his family lived according to Luke, but in Bethlehem of Judea. So short, not that long. Um, this is of course proceeding. Um, the main event, but um, Elizabeth and Zachariah and telling a little bit about their story. Um, was there anything that you heard in her presentation that you weren't aware of before, or haven't heard before? <clears throat> I haven't heard uh, Elizabeth being called a prophet. Mm. Yeah. The revelation. Yeah. 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 She said it doesn't say that in there, but she was. She was the first one to recognize the child that Elizabeth. Mary carried as being Christ the Messiah. God made sure that Jesus had plenty of people to care about him mm. when he was born. Mm. And so, uh, you know, I never, I mean, I thought about it a little before, but she made it very clear. I'm troubled by the time elapsed. So Zacharias is at the church when he's told he's going to be a father. Right? Mary comes to visit his wife and he hasn't told her yet that she's going to be pregnant. But she feels the baby move. There's a time 
Yeah, and she didn't read all of it. Yeah, yeah. Is so, there more between those? I mean, he just there kind of is. Yeah. from church, and she all of a sudden says, "Oh." Time to go to the hospital. Yeah, <laughs> not everything is written, and not everything was uh, shared in what she shared today. But um, yeah, it's kind of a condensed version. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I confess I hadn't read it. Just it was awful fast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah she did speak Mary fast. Stayed with her with Elizabeth until her baby is born. Yeah. Um, until baby, until Elizabeth. Elizabeth's baby is born. Elizabeth and Zachariah, so John the Baptist was born. Yeah. And that's from the text. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't do it with the text. Well, just go home and catch up. <laughs> <laughs> I was glad yeah. that they referenced the story that you were speaking about, Amy. Um, that those that baby leaped when she heard. Yeah. As they say in the in the. Uh, I was just going to say we have to remember that this was written by men. These stories were not written by women, and they were redacted many times at many different uh, by many different groups. So we're not going to hear it from a woman's point of view. So they were leapfrogged in certain places because you know, visually that's what they saw. Hmm. Um, and what we miss really is common English Bible. Sorry, common English Bible. Common English. Bible. So I so I think that's why the stories are different. They're written by two different people. Again, everybody sees things differently, whether you're male or female. Two women could have a totally different point of view. But it it it's interesting, and I love the way she ties in. Um, she ties the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible things in with this. And with the, the story that she's writing about. So um, I think this is a very interesting interpolation of all this material. Mm -hmm. I guess I knew it, but I had to be reminded that they acted out the stories. You know, people were illiterate. And how do you act out? Uh, or how do you speak when you're mute uh, and you're trying to convey what just occurred, a mystical experience that occurred to him, for him, in front of him, with him? And he had to come out in some form or fashion and share that. No. Is that how you would do it? I often wonder how Jesus learned to receive evidently. Or maybe just he was saying what he heard all the time. I don't know. There is the story of him unrolling the scroll in the temple and reading from, from it. And that was when he was 12, wasn't it? No, that was much later. He did, he did though, when he was 12, talk to the elders. Yeah. But Anita, I want you to, to act out that thing again that you just did. <laughs> <laughs> how do you how do you act out having an angel appear? <laughs> no, you are for sure. I think sometimes when, or often, when we say that we do this speech, you know, words are not enough. Mm -hmm. I think um, that you can't really say it in words. And it just seems so flat when we say it words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? Maybe silence was a gift to him. I, I'm starting to think about it. Huh, interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. I read a reflection this morning by Scott Erickson I'm getting his daily reflections from his book, Honest Advent. He was reflecting on the silence that Zachariah experienced after that encounter with the angel and how um, he was questioning, you know, how can this be? And maybe when we begin to question what God can do, we need to be struck dumb, you know, so that we can sit with that, um, with with the amazing, impossible things that God can do. Kind of the same note, like a mystical experience is you know, kind of by definition of something beyond what the self you know, can uh, take in, beyond what the mind and you know, our normal consciousness can take in. So it's... 
I think my, I find it interesting that he's saying that he's, he's struck dumb because it's like now yeah, he's put into a position where he has to embody it, he has to contradict it, he has to stick with it, he yeah. can't just grab lock how mm. cool it was, mm. you know, and thereby uh, kind of lose the, mm. the, the miracle of, of uh, experience. Yeah. yeah, just describe it, it just contains it, it, it boxes it in. and. He doesn't get his speech back until they're naming the, the boy, and she wants to name him John, and it's tradition to name it after the boy after the father. And then finally, he, he writes out it, his name is John, and then he can speak. Uh, so how long was that? I don't remember, but it's quite a, quite a length of time to be silent. That was the whole course of her pregnancy. So yeah, nine months. <laughs> that's interesting too, in light of what you're saying, that, that his having to sit with it was a germination of its own for that same length of time, the pregnancy. That's pretty cool. Right, that they were both just stating a miracle. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I love the, the power of it in this and in, in Jesus, right? That we have all these traditions, but to go against tradition to say, oh, this will be the name. Almost like they come with, like all kids come with their own truth, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's not the end of this time that I was just. Yeah. yeah, I've been watching a lot of the coverings on PBS about indigenous peoples, and they, it's a speaking and lining people that have so much trouble. Uh, being with the spirit, uh, indigenous people are a lot, a lot closer. They see the spirit in everyone. And so at that time, you know, people were beginning to use writing a lot more. So actually, but, but actually there were still a lot of people that, that did probably speak to the spirit. So they weren't, wasn't maybe as shocking as it is to us. Not sure. <laughs> yeah. It kind of ties into this second question. What does the story say to us about being open to surprises and to world a world otherwise? I love her expression, staggering news. Trying to negotiate my camera here so we get everything. There we go. <laughs> Staggering news, yeah. Yeah, I think um, I get, I can get hopeless watching the images that I mentioned this morning. And uh, there's one line, I've repeated it a few times, I think in staff meeting, um, that says that the, the current world is dying. The new is already here. The old is just making a lot of noise dying as it dies. And um, being open to see the new, um, that, that is already here. Um, being open to staggering news. Is it really? Yeah, yeah. Do I have my mind open enough to see what God is doing? I think the other piece of that is that we don't know what that's going to look like. That's, you know, I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was you even said that hope is something that it is about what we don't know and can't even really imagine, but hope for anyway, that it has to do with God and God's being present. Um, was that you that said that? We were talking about hope at staff meeting. I wonder if it was. It could have been, yeah. It was, okay, yeah. So, <laughs> well, so you know, that that really struck me deeply because looking at the web um, telescope images and seeing just how huge the universe is and 
how much God's time is different from our time, all those things. It makes me realize I don't have a clue. And I just have to be really open to the fact that whatever is going to happen, it's not going to be something I can imagine. It's going to be a whole new thing. Staggering. Staggering. I had a, a, a kind of a aha moment with that, thinking about God's time, because I was thinking about my time and geologic time, you know, mm-hmm. human time and geologic time. You know, you, you look at our timeline, it's this, this little blip on the end of geologic time. I'm like, well, what does that make God's timeline look like? Mm-hmm. Because geologic time is probably this Earth's geologic time is probably this infinitesimal hair on God's timeline. So if we're like this sixteenth of an inch on geologic timeline, like okay, we go back to the cosmic dust thing, mm-hmm. some stardust thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I still can't. That, that's that staggering mm-hmm. piece. Mm-hmm. You need both. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Got the motion. I, yeah. I, I, I don't have glasses to hold my eyeballs in my right hand <laughs> anymore. Thanks be to God. Yes, thanks be to God. <laughs> and Dr. Suhu and the two that's it. Well, that's what Jesus says somewhere. Don't worry so much about the future or the past. Live in the moment. Um, so <laughs> do moment. what we can where we are. The moment's a little ugly. Yeah, the moment's yeah. pretty ugly. Yeah. Right? yeah, but do what we can where we but are. But there, there is humor. And first world problems to think about, to laugh about. My friends who showed up for their Hawaii cruise on the right date, the right month, the wrong year. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> I don't think that's so funny. I've done stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, they have a that's even for, funnier. <laughs> they have a cruise for next year. <laughs> <laughs> well, my friend, my neighbor next door. They set up this trip to, to go to Israel. They were so excited. And, you know, it was like a week before the war started. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. forget that. <laughs> they won't let us go, I'm sure, for quite a long time. That's true of the, the one here, too. The footsteps of Paul has replaced the footsteps of Jesus as, as the yeah. pilgrimage. Yeah. So, um, Amy Jill says, I regard these gospel stories as Jewish stories, and so part of my own history. Matthew and Luke quote Jewish sources, draw on Jewish images, are set in Jewish homeland, and describe a Jewish Messiah. If we miss that context, we'll also miss much of the message. So, What do we lose if we leave Zachariah and Elizabeth out of the story? What do they add, both symbolically and literally, to the good news? Well, if you leave them out, you leave out John. Mm. And if you leave out John, Jesus doesn't get baptized. And I think that's an important part because... You know, he, he said that this has to be done. He says it follows on, and that all brings us in as part of the family. And thinking about that, I think the other piece of that is that um, John is likened to Elijah. And so, that, again, that puts it back in the Jewish context. Yeah. And um, the forerunner the baptizer in this case, 
So that lends a whole, to me, a whole kind of profound depth to, to those stories. That they, you know, thinking about the Elijah coming before and what that means. They're connectors, for sure. Mm -hmm. The old to the new, a continuation of that story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I was thinking of this once, and the Magi already knew Jesus when they came. They knew Jesus was coming. That's why they came. They guessed it. They had the, again, that faith that, that we've been talking about, that hope in something that, I mean, I doubt they were expecting a baby, you know, it's like traveled across continents and um, looking for whatever the star portended. Um, I don't think they were like looking for something small and helpless and powerless. They went to Herod's house first, you know, and didn't get any luck there. So, but they knew when they saw. They knew when they saw. I think, which is amazing, also, isn't it? In and of itself. I think for me, I've got two tracks. Let's see if I can remember them both. One is, well, what if John the Baptist was born? and played the role, but we didn't really hear the story until mm -hmm. maybe the baptism of Jesus. Uh -huh. yeah. So part of it is our religious history and heritage. And the more you know about your history and your heritage, the deeper it is and the more connections you can make. And you can see where Jesus comes and honors what's gone before and changes it. Mm -hmm. So that's the one thing I wanted to say. The other thing I wanted to say is I was just sitting here thinking about Zacharias's response. Mary's like, angel occurs, and Mary's like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm doing this. And Zacharias is like, um, can I can I see the letter? I, I, think, you're, I think you're misreading. <laughs> and yeah, Zacharias and Elizabeth we're still blessed. God did not smite that grace. So for me, that also shows that both responses are human. Both responses are reasonable and God honors both responses and still blesses the recipient. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's neat. Like that. Yeah. Uh, I just had an image there while you were speaking of, um, you know, Gabriel appearing before Zachariah and speaking of Zacharias. Who's <laughs> 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 talking about? <laughs> <laughs> we're old. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't get the memo on this. So. <laughs> I think there's so many ways that you know, Zachariah and Elizabeth and John like paint the way what's coming, like they make the whole thing more understandable or palatable to the to the communities that they're in because you know Mary you can like you can have some doubt like did she have sex with somebody else you know, mm -hmm. like that? This, this is how but Elizabeth you know <laughs> is really old is really old by their standards for childbirth like there's no doubt about what's going on in the future that this is a miracle and then John is the, and then Zacharias is like struck dumb, like he cannot speak. Like that's a, the, these are like, they're really blatant, like something's happening, you know, that, that has a mystical component to it that's, that's beyond our norm here. And it, it's like, it kind of sets the stage for us, for people, for them to be able to believe more when Jesus, you know, arrives on the scene. So to speak. And John, you know, his passion and his drive is getting it. You know, he's out there in the world just like you know, hammering the world with this is coming, this is the time, this is happening now. You know, and for you know, a decade longer before Jesus. I mean, like he is like he's driving the message of it. This is happening now, this is coming. And I just think, you know, 
it changes the whole thing. Like if they're not there, then you know you have this you know, uh, amazing mystic Jesus arrives on the scene and there's oh. no one to listen. <laughs> wow. You know? yeah. huh. There's no one there to listen. Huh. It's, it's not anybody's mind. It's just so far out that nobody can contemplate or think about things that happened before. Yeah. Um, well, and in Luke, gives us the lineage for Zechariah and for Elizabeth. And then they take Mary in. She stays with them, um, which I think helps give her legitimacy um, and protection but of what um, that um, they're. But the miracles that they're witnessing, um, or people are witnessing through them, um, like I guess rubs off on Mary, mm -hmm. and helps protect her. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've always been struck by the first turning upside down of all the miracles and all the literature mm -hmm. and all the history, because. Um, Elizabeth wasn't the first barren woman to bear a child as a miracle. We have Sarah, and children were born to barren people as a miracle. And this was the first virgin, or the. So it was the first opportunity to just say, okay, we're going to flip the script here. This is a different miracle. This is the big miracle. So it was the first turning upside down of all of that long history that we've had heritage. I have a question. And again, because I didn't do any homework. But why does Mary stay with Zachariah and his wife? Their relatives. Doesn't she have family? Doesn't she have a mother and a father? And it never mentions that. Mm -hmm. But she must have. We know later. And, mm -hmm. but you know, why, you know, why do women who are draw uh, need to be with other women um, during pregnancy? We don't know the whole backstory, but we can guess. Mm -hmm. uh, they well, were relatives and then she traveled to be there. That well, that could be when I mean, she was pregnant out of wedlock Protection. and that would have been really dangerous. Yeah, mm -hmm. it could have gotten her stoned. To be pregnant without having a. And they lived very close together. Well, they were. It says that she traveled quite a bit. Going back to what Betsy was saying, another traveling up into the hill country, they say. So mm -hmm. it was probably a ways. Yeah. But anyway, that, you know, we don't really know, but um, could have been because they were really worried that she was going to get killed by the community. Mm -hmm. I mean, you think about it, you have an unwed. Mother, teenager. Yeah. Someplace remote. Yeah. Well, and, out, and, and then down. Nazareth is pretty flat, but there's the hills are very close, but they're some of them are very high. Um, so that's um, it would have been hard to climb the hills, but it might not have been too far. Well, at any rate, she mm -hmm. went somewhere. Else, she didn't stay with her family. Didn't stay with her mom and dad. Well, they were in the picture. It's kind of interesting. And John to make an interesting inference around the whole thing. Like, she gets pregnant and then she leaves and goes to stay with Elizabeth and Zachariah, right? So that uh, you know, maybe she left because of that because the community was you know, uh, against her, mm -hmm. right? And then the next thing we the next thing we really see is that. She's traveling with Joseph somewhere. Mm -hmm. They're out of town. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 So the whole area where the where um, where Joseph's at, like they're avoiding, like it's getting very much avoided. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's true. true. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. yeah, Joseph is spoken to in a dream too. Right? Yeah. Mary mm -hmm. as his wife. Yeah. So I'm sorry. Well, that's a different. I think this whole story is really about trust. Mm -hmm. Who did she trust? What story mm -hmm. did they trust mm -hmm. the angel? 
who did they trust? And I think trust is a very important part of this. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously went to relatives because she could trust. He was a priest, so priests were somebody you could trust. And so you go right down the line. It's about trust and truth. Yeah, that's that's a neat observation. I love that too because I think for me, that's why I love the invitation so much. It's about connection and caring. And one of my biggest challenges, just personally, with um, that I can't, I can't make this leap the way that some Christians really do, and that is to take Jesus out of context. Because I think the, the long road for me is that that makes him so unlike me that I don't have to follow him, I can say, oh, but that's Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. But the more that I know about his world and the more I know about that context, I can relate it to mine. I can be jealous of the fact that Mary went to him. It's like because a tender story, you know, a young girl. I would be so afraid that here's this elder who I need to trust, and she's probably afraid too, being an elder and pregnant. I would love the the connections there. So whenever we get tiny glimpses, because we don't get a lot of the kinship ties, we get names and lists, but we don't get the mm -hmm. hard kind of stories, mm -hmm. maybe because to Terry's point, mm -hmm. men are writing the story. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I love those parts. No, yes. That's fine. <laughs> so, so I read a book about Jesus. It was condemned by the Catholic Church. Uh, it was Jesus growing up as a teenager. Okay, so in his life as a teenager, he travels around with these guys. Oh, uh, they do guys things, you know. I think he read that. Yeah. Oh yeah. We read the last church. But I think I didn't have a teenager then. They didn't consider me a teenager. Okay, well, let's move on to the next question since we're getting a little short on time. So Zachariah and Elizabeth represent communal memory, which Amy's been talking about a little bit too in a different way. The older people in the family, the aging of bodies, and the sense that waiting and waiting might never find a goal. What is lost when older people are not recognized for their gifts and not appreciated for their hopes? We're all too young. <laughs> <laughs> you know a whole lot more about life when you're older, that's for sure. Yeah, I yeah. remember. <laughs> that's the trick. <laughs> well, you don't even have to remember it. It's, it's, it's your body, your mind, your everything that happens. That, <clears throat> well, you lose connections. Start making connections that you never made when you were young. So connections like what, Betsy? Well, partly where you came from, mm -hmm. whether it be um, familial connect connections or community connections as well. Um, and I'm, I think I may just be kind of a little bit in the dumps because I'm feeling that right now. It's that time of year, and you know. I have family members that are gone, and, and it's like, I can't remember if we did this this way or, mm. you know, what was that recipe? Mm. And what happened to this? You know, what happened to that book of recipes that mom had put together or that grandma had put together? And, um, why did we do things that way? Mm. You know, that kind of thing. Um, or, you know, the community I grew up in used to do this, and they no longer do that. Why do they no longer do that? Um, but the elders aren't there anymore. And so things have changed. But, you know, you just don't have those connections anymore. I think, too, there's a sense of balance of wisdom, I'm not sure what the word is that I want to put on this, but in a way it's the difference between say an older aunt and uncle or grandparents and their and the next generation. That the more you live, hopefully, 
the more you understand what the important parts are. And when you're a young person, you're still trying to figure out all of life. <clears throat> if you don't have elders to help you see, yes, what you're going through is rough right now, but it's going to get better. Or this is a way to deal with it. Or, you know, that, that wisdom, that experience that um, even, even if there's not wisdom, if it's a, a, an experience of, I've been there, I've been there too. Mm -hmm. and I survived you know it, and so if you aren't listening if you don't have elders in your tribe it's it's a real loss and of course Elizabeth had never had a baby so she didn't know about pregnancy but she knew how wonderful it was <laughs> and she could convey that yeah yeah, so that, that whole sense of history, I always thought that the U.S. is a little deprived that way because mm -hmm. we, we don't live in our ancestral villages here. We don't have connections to the, the people of our past. I remember my first um, trip overseas to Ireland. We went to the Dublin Museum, and, um, you know, they have those little dioramas of the ancient peoples, you know, and I was like... Oh, those people are white, you know, those people living in those, those strange huts, those are white people. <laughs> it was like, you know, it reminded me again that, that the land I live in is not my ancestral home. And uh, that, that really, I think, makes a difference to a lot of things in how we think as, as uh, people of the U.S., you know, willingness to blow things up and tear things apart and so on. I think may be the result of that in part. Well, I think that life in general, as we live through it, has changed because of work. Families no longer live together, or live next door to each other, or you're part of a community of people. Like I grew up in an Italian neighborhood. You had to be Italian to live there. But then we start allowing the Swedes in, and it really screwed up. <laughs> but the reality is, I think life in the United States has forced this change. In other words, you know, I'm in Colorado, but I lived my life till I was 30 in my hometown uh, with people in my mixed neighborhood. I think that's one of the gifts that the church can offer because we call yeah. ourselves brothers and sisters. You yeah. know, my father, as an anthropologist, called that fictive kin, but he said that often fictive kin can be much more real than sometimes our blood kin are. And that's what we experience. And there's one other story coming up. You all are probably familiar with it when they dedicate Jesus at the temple, and there's Simeon and Anna who are elders they've been worshiping waiting to see the coming of the messiah and they're there to see it mm -hmm. and then simeon's song is part of one of our liturgies that's just so beautiful mm -hmm. but that's that connection with and our ancestors you know, that have been <clears throat> traveling to totally like it, living in other countries for so long nothing but the church felt like coming home mm -hmm. because when we would be home we came home St. Paul's, and that's like that was our family. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and we used to think of it as our home family. The church was our home family. Mm -hmm. Those are the people that knew us well, sometimes too well. <laughs> <laughs> but the reality is that you're right. The church in itself is family. Yeah, and you are an elder. Sorry, yeah. and you had to bring that up. I did because it's important. You're wise. I think we're connected, and the beauty of my personal faith in the Anglican tradition, mm -hmm. because it is much older than mm. here we are in the United States of America. Mm. Our Anglican tradition can be traced back, and as John Roberts would say often about the Nicene Creed. 
that he wanted it always because that was his connection. He could go anywhere in the world to an Episcopal church. An and Anglican then, church, yeah. An Anglican and church. And way to sought out the Anglican church. Anglican churches, and, and there you are, and that becomes home even if you know no one around you. I have a hymn book coming tomorrow that I ordered called Hymns of the Heart, which is Anglican hymns. Mm -hmm. um, and they're all public domain. And it's a hundred of them. And I looked at them and it said, you may know, you probably know the words to all of them, but some of them may be to hymns or to tunes that you don't recognize. Um, but they're all public domain, so they can all be copied with impunity. We can say with exuberance. Yeah, exuberance. Okay. Okay. Before we, we go to the next step, I want to make sure that Elaine, um, I see you on screen. Did you, you have anything that you wanted to share? Oh, it's just fun to hear you all talk. Um, I just wanted to say, I feel like without the elders in the story without Zachariah and Elizabeth, we miss that waiting sense and we miss the fulfillment because they were waiting for a child. So, you know, their pregnancy was a sense of fulfillment. And without them, we would just have Mary kind of being surprised, like she was not waiting for a child at that moment. So I just love that sense of suspense and fulfillment that you get from the elders in the context of the story. Um, and I was also just thinking Zachariah is my new hero because I just had never realized that he had that intense mystical experience. And then immediately he was forced to go out and communicate without <laughs> just being the communication, right? Like go tell people what happened without speaking. I just love that like blundering aspect of our lives. And I think it's such a role model for me. Like if he could find a way to do this with sign language, like we can find a way to do it too with all of our <laughs> hindrances. So mm -hmm. those are my thoughts, but. <clears throat> Thank you, Elaine. I love that, yeah. Well, um, we'll kind of close today with a song from our spiritual ancestors, Psalm 40, verse five. And uh, Joe, could you read it for us? <laughs> and then I'll close this with a prayer. Yeah. Right there. You, Lord, my God, you've done so many things, your wonderful deeds and your plans for us. No one can compare with you. If I were to proclaim and talk about all of them, they would be too numerous to count. God of Advent and Christmas, we thank you for coming into our world through the story of Elizabeth and of Zechariah. May we hope with their faithful hope for what may seem impossible. Thank you for the many gifts you give us during this season. And as we travel it, may we be mindful of your presence all along the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.